Good morning, friendship family. Good morning, friendship family. Thank you very much. It is a blessing to be in God's house today. And what better way to start a time of worship than with the uh, beautiful act of baptism. And so we have three candidates this morning who have all come and made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of their life. And they're coming this morning to publicly show the world that they, that they love the Lord and that He is the Lord and Savior of their life, that uh, they just want to follow Him in every aspect of their life. And so as we get ready to begin this time of worship together this morning, bow with me for just a moment. Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for a <clears throat> wonderful time and opportunity of worship today, Father. Father, I thank You for the, these three men who have come and and, uh, and, Father, shared their faith in Jesus Christ, Father, and how you have touched and changed their life. And, Father, not only to change their life, you have changed their eternity. And, Father, what a blessing that truly is. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to celebrate with them and their families here today. We love you and we thank you and we praise your name. Amen. Our first candidate this morning, Mr. Caleb McDonald. It is my privilege this morning, as Caleb has made his decision for Christ and made that public, it is my privilege this morning to be able to baptize him as a brother in Christ. And I do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. next candidate this morning, Mr. Austin English. Austin came and shared with me that he had made his decision for Christ, and he works a lot on Sundays, but he's been coming on Sunday nights when he can, and on Wednesdays, and he has made his public profession, and it's my privilege this morning to be able to baptize him as a brother in Christ. I do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Noah. Noah Smith came a few weeks ago and made his decision public. He was here on a Wednesday night, and uh, God just touched his life, and he realized he needed to know Christ as his Lord and his Savior. So, hey, you can get, you can get saved on Wednesday nights at church. Some of you may not realize that, but you can. God will save you. It don't matter what day of the week it is. And uh, we celebrate with him today, and it is my privilege to baptize him as a brother in Christ. And I do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're visiting with us this morning, you are a family member of one of our candidates this morning. We want to just welcome you to Friendship Baptist Church. God has done so many wonderful and amazing things in the life of our church, and we're going to continue to share some of that with you this morning as well as we talk a little bit about Bible drills this morning from both our youth and our children. So thank you ladies for doing that. Well, my name is Jody Austin and I am the leader for the children's Bible drills this year. And my helpers were Lita Searcy and Lauren McDonald, and I want to give them a round of applause. Thank y'all. I couldn't have done it without them. So I'm going to call up our kids, and I want you to stand up here so your parents can get a picture if they want to, because I know that's hard to get sometimes. So we're going to start with Mackenzie Austin, and she gets a three-year medallion. Our next 
guy is Garrett Lee. He gets a three-year medallion. Next, we have Jenna Winner, and she gets a first-year ribbon. Next, we have Katie McDonald, and she gets a first-year ribbon. Next, we have John Riley Searcy, and he gets a first-year ribbon. Next, we have Anagail Alston, and she gets a first-year ribbon. Tucker Koontz, and he gets a first-year ribbon. We have Alexa Delgado, and she's not here today, but she gets a first-year ribbon. And we had a Bible buddy who is Lily Winner, and she's not here today, but she gets a first-year ribbon, too, for Bible buddy. <laughs> this year has been challenging, but they have done an excellent job, and I'm just proud of them for knowing God's Word in their heart. Ms. Linda? I want to recognize our youth, and I've had the privilege of working with these young people on Sunday afternoons, and I want to thank them so much for giving of their time to come and to study God's Word. And um, I'm giving them some awards today, but one day in heaven, God's going to reward you for your faithfulness. So, Kent, Hayden Lee, I'm going to let you be first. This is Hayden's first year. And you, and he gets a ribbon and a participant for church. So, God bless you, Hayden. You. Next, we have Cameron McCullough. And some of these are last year's because of COVID. They didn't get some of their awards. This is a four-year plaque because Cameron has been in Bible drills for four years. And this makes her fifth year. So, this was last year's award. And then here's her to go on her plaque. And then she also got a participant state drill excellent award in state drill. So I'm so proud of Cameron. And then Jaden Pickle. Jaden gets his four year for last year plaque, and he gets a little strip to go in for his fifth year in Bible drills, and he also gets his seal for associational. Thank you, Jaden. And we have some that said, don't you call me, but I'm going to still mention them. Because they came and participated and learned some scriptures, but they decided they didn't want to go through the stuff. But Caden Pickle, he had a little job, so it kept him from participating. But he came and learned some scriptures. And Eli would sneak in a lot of times and time us, and so he learned some scriptures too. So I'm thankful for them. But most of all, I'm thankful for your parents because y'all are the ones that uh, have seen that they get to practice and to learn God's Word. And we'll be starting up soon. We're going to be in the Blue Cycle. So you can already go online and sort of see what the Blue Cycle and already start learning for next year. And I'm going to encourage you as parents to get your children here. And I want to read a verse of scripture in Matthew 7:11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You give your children good gifts, but the best gift you can give your children is the Word of God. So I ask that you get them involved in children's Bible drill and youth Bible drill, because now more than ever, we need to know our Word, because any day, I've been told this all my life, it can be taken from you, but I'm standing here today before you, thinking that before long, this will be taken from us. So only what you put up here, and your children need that. So I ask that you do next year, see that your children get involved in Bible drill, because it's very, very important. Thank you all. I love you.
This morning's, this morning's song service has been selected for two reasons. The songs will sing about the worthiness of Jesus, that he is the victor over all, and that we have victory through him, and because of that, we have life with him, and we can approach him whenever we need to. And we're going to invite you to stand as we begin by singing Majesty. Worship His Majesty. If you'll join us. so much for singing. I could hear you. We're going to continue with victory in Jesus. If you'll join us, please. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to
can be seated. We've already mentioned the theme of our songs this morning, but now the choir is going to, and it is so great to have a choir again. Amen. <laughs> it has been forever and a day, and we're finally getting back in the swing of things. So I appreciate these folks and their work and giving of their time and their talent and their abilities. And the choir is going to present a fairly new praise worship song, Victor's Crown. <laughs>
very graciously agreed to run down from the computer to help us to sing and but the message of that song because Jesus is the victor I mentioned in the choir room he is the victor over this world he is the victor over death he's the victor over anything that arises in our path and he will be the victor forever when we stay in heaven with him at the end of our lives here we have something to celebrate one of the great things that we are allowed to do when we are a child of God, in Scripture it says that we can approach the throne of grace freely. And we're going to sing about that right now. The great, fairly new hymn, Before the Throne of God Above. We're going to invite you to help us to sing. Sing the words. Make them your own. Sing what you mean. Okay? Before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Before Brother Tim comes to deliver the message that God has handed to him for us, we're going to sing a hymn that requests him to speak to us. Not just to our ears, but to our soul and to our heart. So we're, sing along with us, Speak to My Heart.
wonderful day so far. Now it's my turn. I hope it keeps going. Uh, I didn't realize when I got up this morning I'd have two baths before the day gets started real well too. Uh, the water was nice and warm this morning. That's, I've been in other situations where it weren't, wasn't so uh, warm, uh, but it was night today and man, God's just been good to us and to our church and celebrating baptism, celebrating Bible drills and just celebrating the Lord. And so we continue to worship together this morning. We've been looking over the last few weeks about uh, honoring God and determining where our honor is and how we should honor Him in, in every aspect of our life. And we've talked about honoring God's Word and making it real. And, you know, if we believe it, then we need to honor it. And you know, this morning, we're going to begin to look at the idea of honoring God in hard times. Anybody here had a hard time before? Yeah, if you didn't raise your hand, you just lying. That's okay. I don't understand. We've all had hard times. We've all had difficult moments in our life. And let's be honest, sometimes we're facing those things right now. You know, times are hard. Things are difficult. Life is tough. Families are tough. Work is tough. It just, it's an endless number of, of possibilities of what could be out there that we are facing. And how do we, as a believer in Christ, how do we really honor God in those hard times. Open your Bible with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 6 through 11. Paul here, of course, is writing his, what we call 2 Corinthians. Actually, it's his fourth letter to the Corinthian church. There's a couple of others that we don't see biblically, but he's writing those letters to the Corinthian church here and uh, he's just sharing with them here some things that, that God has just put on his heart and, and just a desire to, to give God the, the glory that, that he deserves. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the life of Christ Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live as, for excuse me, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. Now, what was going on in Paul's life when he actually wrote this letter to the Corinthian church? Let me tell you something. He was, at this point in time, being severely attacked. Paul was just one of those guys who shared the gospel. He didn't care who he shared it with. He didn't care what the, the nationality was, the religion was, the race was. Man, he just shared the gospel of Christ with anybody he met that would listen. And in doing so, he made a lot of people mad. He made a lot of people upset. And his enemies had uh, attacked him. They had uh, attacked his credibility as an apostle there. 
I mean, how in the world could someone like Paul, who was really just a murderer, how could he be testifying for Jesus Christ today? He, he killed Christians to begin with. They attacked his ability to communicate and his oratory skills and, and, and the things that he said or didn't say correctly. They, they attacked his personal appearance. They, they attacked everything they could about Paul. I mean, it's just come, kind of like sometimes happened to us. We just feel like, man, why is everybody, you know, attacking me? Why is everybody kind of getting at me here? Well, how does Paul respond? Well, I guess, let me guess. Let me step and say this: How would you? How do you respond when somebody attacks you? I mean, let's be honest. The normal thing is, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back, right? You know, we get we, our defenses go up as as soon as we're attacked. You know, we the wall goes up. And wait a minute, what are you doing here? And and it's so easy to to lash back out at someone else when they've lashed at us. Paul doesn't do that. You see, Paul, first of all, understands that they're attacking him because of, of Christ. They're attacking him because of the gospel, but Paul kind of likes that. And really, he, he kind of embraces the fact that, that he is not perfect. He embraces the fact that, that all of these things they're saying about him, really, <laughs> they are true. Paul understands that, that, you know, as a vessel, he was unimpressive. It's not about the vessel being impressive, ladies and gentlemen. It's what fits, is filled inside of the vessel that makes it so important. I was watching a show the other day, and, and uh, it was one of those shows, they blow glass, and it was a little competition thing, and one of the individuals that was on that show, uh, one of the things that they did, I guess, to, to make a living is they designed perfume bottles. Now, if you go to the store today, especially if you go to, I guess, maybe some high-end or higher-end perfumes, you know, they've got these hand-blown glasses and, and, uh, that the perfume is in, and, I mean, just some, some kind of beautiful stuff. The vessel may be beautiful, but I'll be honest with you, I've opened up some bottles and I've smelt of some stuff, and I'm thinking, man, this stuff stinks. They want so many, you know, they want so many hundreds of dollars for this. This stuff stinks. Man, the outside can look good, but what's important, Paul is saying, because he knew that on the outside he was terrible. Man, on the outside he had all kinds of mistakes. On the outside he was being attacked for just who he was, and he said, it's not about my outside, it is about my inside. It is about what's within me that makes all the difference in the world. I mean, for us, if God was only going to use a, 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 an impressive vessel, the only person he could have ever used would have been Jesus. The rest of us are Im, not impressive, you know, in that sense. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. That's important there, ladies and gentlemen. To honor God in the hard times, to understand that, that the things of God is, is about God, it's not about us. I look back and I just kind of run down a list of individuals that, that God used. We go back and start, I guess, from not just all the way to the beginning, but pretty far back, we look at Abraham. And, man, Abraham was the father of a great nation. Abraham, he's that amazing Old Testament figure that just, you know, God called and, and Abram and became Abraham and, you know, just so many things in, in Abraham's life. But the Bible tells us that there were two different times, I'm sure there were others, but two different times when Abraham found himself in a hard time, and so he decided to call his wife his sister. And both times got him into trouble. Not perfect, but definitely someone who could be used by God. We think of Moses as well, the human deliverer of, of the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And man, the Bible tells us very quickly that Moses had a bad temper. I mean, let's be honest, why did he have to leave Egypt to begin with? 
he murdered someone. He saw something happening. He didn't like it. He went off on somebody and he killed them. He had a bad temper. And by his own words, he said, I'm inadequate to speak. And so he got saddled with his brother who made a lot of mistakes as well. The vessel, this vessel, ladies and gentlemen, is an imperfect vessel. But oh, how God can use us. We think of the Old Testament again, and we think of a guy named David. And the Bible says a man after God's own heart, and he was guilty of adultery and murder. We think of Elijah, who confronted hundreds of the prophets of Baal there as well, and, and, and called fire down from heaven. But Jezebel scared him to death, and he ran in fear after all of that had happened. Isaiah, an awesome prophet of God, says that I am a man of unclean lips. Peter, the leader of the twelve apostles, openly confessed that he was a sinful man, and he proved it when he vehemently denied Jesus Christ three times just before his death. The passage here unfolds before us and gives us some characteristics that, that Paul was marked with. And I think these are characteristics that help us to honor God in some difficult times and hard times in our life. Paul was, was humble and invincible and fruitful and faithful. He was worshipful. He was helpful. He was hopeful. I mean, Paul just, he loved God. And he wanted to honor him no matter what. In this first book to the Corinthian church, Paul writes in chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing to bring nothing that is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. Paul knew from the very beginning that it's not about me. And that when times are hard and when things are difficult, if we're going to honor God, we're going to do so not because of what's on the outside, not because of what people are saying about us on the outside, not because of circumstances that are happening around us on the outside, not because life seems to be sometimes falling apart, not because we've had the worst day we've ever had in our life, but we're going to honor God because of what's on the inside. And ladies and gentlemen, that sets us apart. That makes all the difference in the world. And so I want to share with you this morning a few ideas related to honoring God in these hard times. Looking back and again at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, understand this first of all, that affliction does not bring destruction. Verses 8 and 9 says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And think about that for a moment, just those couple of verses for a moment. The idea of being afflicted there, if you go back and look up that word, it means to, to be pressed hard upon, to find one's in a, oneself into a narrow place. Simply put, it just really means to be, to be put under pressure. Man, that's life, is it not today? That's the world around us, is it not today? Man, we are afflicted. We are pressed down. We are in narrow places. We are under pressure. But Paul says, but not crushed. Other translations may say, but not destroyed. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it does not matter what's going on around you. All the affliction that the old devil can throw at us, all the affliction that this sinful world can sling our way, understand they do not cause a believer's destruction. God is there with us. We may face the affliction, but as a child of God, we are not crushed. To be perplexed, he says. The idea there is to be without any resource. In other words, you've at, you're at your, your wit's end. You don't have a clue what to do. You don't know where to go from here. Perplexed, but not in despair. When the world looks at us, ladies and gentlemen, and says, you don't have a clue, we don't have to have a clue because we know the one who does. When the world looks at us and says, you don't have an understanding of what's going on, we don't have to have an understanding of what's happening, of what's going on. We don't have to have the answers because we know the one who does. We may be perplexed, but as a child of God, there is no despair. We may be overwhelmed, but as a child of God, there is no despair. (laughs) Paul, when you look at this, you think, man, Paul was in trouble. But it was going to be okay. Paul was at the brink, at the edge of defeat. But he was not defeated. I know that, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes in our lives as Christians, and because of the world and everything around us, it just seems like everything is pressing in. It seems like we are about to lose everything. That's not going to happen. A true born-again believer in Christ, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to tell you this morning that everything's going to be okay. Okay. I'm not going to tell you this morning that there's not going to be difficult times. But I will tell you this morning that as a child of God, the most important thing in your life, you cannot lose. You cannot lose Christ. He is always there. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted. Man, if Paul, if anybody knew about persecution, it was Paul. Because of his faith, he was driven away, he was hunted, he was beaten, he was thrown in jail, he was on the run, so to speak. Oh man, he was persecuted, he says. But not abandoned. When you think about that concept of not being abandoned, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one person in the life of a believer who will never abandon you. And as much as I love my wife, I can't say that it's her. As much as I have friends and family that I love dearly that I never want to abandon, I'm human, I can't say that, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will never be abandoned by my Lord. And for you and I, we always can hold on to that. When everything else seems to fall apart, when all the persecution is everywhere around us, when it seems like we've been abandoned by everybody else, we may have, but not the Lord. Struck down, he says. If you go back and look at that Greek word, the idea of struck down, to be thrown down, it actually is, is kind of uh, relates to the idea of having a, a wrestling match. I really figured there'd be a wrestler, wrestling fan who would give me a holler or something there or something. Ric Flair would jump. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes it just happens and I apologize and go on. (laughs) To be struck down. To be in a fight. A match. Overwhelmed. But then he says, but not destroyed. You ever felt like you've been in a fight before that you couldn't win? Life, you can't overcome. 
it's tough and you don't know what to do, you just struck down. Ladies and gentlemen, know this. Know this. That you and I cannot be destroyed. You know, I... I grew up and in that time of, the, uh, of life when, when the Rocky movies came out. Man, and old Rocky movies, you knew, he just got pummeled. If that was real life, I mean, it wouldn't go that far, we know, but it's a movie and it's just like every time he got knocked down, what did he do? He got back up. He got back up. Every time he was struck down. Man, he just got back up. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I can get knocked down over and over and over again in life when life is hard. But as a child of God, get back up. We're not there alone. Man, he is there with us and, and this affliction that we are going and facing and over and looking at in our life, it does not bring our destruction. So if it doesn't bring destruction, what's it for? What's it, you know, why do we have to go through all of this stuff? Well, first and secondly, affliction is for the purpose of purification. Verse 17 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. I don't know about you, but this momentary light affliction, sometimes the description of that is just, it doesn't work out. <clears throat> Naomi and I, and my brother and sister, were on, uh, my brother, brother and his wife, excuse me, so the four, two couples, we were on a, a cruise one time, and we were, we were in the Bahamas, and we were going to do a little tour and it tells us on here, you read the description of that tour, that there is a leisurely bicycle ride. <laughs> that was the words they used. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, those folks will lie to you. <laughs> a leisurely bicycle ride. And on the way, you got to see some dolphins and see this beach and all this leisurely bicycle ride. We go there and, and, and get there and, 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 and man, I, I don't know where they got their bicycles from, but it wasn't Walmart. I mean, they were terrible. There was not a 10-speed bicycle anywhere, one of those old stuff. You pedal and whatever you got is all you got. I mean... That leisurely bicycle ride was about 11 miles. <laughs> and the guy in front, the, the, the leader of the group, you know, the guy we paid money to do this, was like, y'all come on, keep up, keep up. Let's get. He was like he was on a motorcycle. So anybody, do not do the leisurely bicycle ride. I'm just telling you. And we laughed, and that's been years ago, and we, have, we still laugh about that. And every now and then, for some unknown reason, it pops in my head, and y'all get a story like that. I, I don't know. But, you know, sometimes life, those leisurely afflictions, That momentary light affliction, I'll be honest with you, sometimes they don't seem so light. Sometimes life is overwhelming. But the rest of that verse says this, is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. You say, what now? Boiling it all down, it says this. Man, when we go through some difficult times, the purpose of the affliction is so that you and I grow in our faith. We grow in our trust, in our faith, in our honor of who God is. 
Now, I learned a few things about some leisurely bicycle rides. I won't do another one. I learned that lesson. But I've also learned some lessons about the affliction in my own life. Whether I consider it to be light or heavy or however you want to describe your own, I've realized a long time ago that God is always there. God never leaves us behind. God's, God's not up front hollering at us saying, hey, come on, keep up. Let's go. But he's there beside us to strengthen us and to help us, to grow us. If we just honor him, trust him, to have faith in him. This affliction that we face, it doesn't bring destruction and it is for the purpose of purification so that it can eventually bring about transformation. Isaiah 48 verse 10 says, Look, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Transformation usually comes to us, ladies and gentlemen, at a, at a great cost. To transform land is, is pretty expensive. Uh, I remember down here, you know, Pea Ridge Road here, those folks out there, I don't know who it is, you go down far enough and all that land there on the right, and they went out there and cleared off. I, I, you know, they wanted trying to sell lots and all those things. I can only imagine how much money they spent preparing that land and transforming that land. I mean, it was a pretty expensive project, I, I can almost guarantee. And it's a pretty expensive project for you and I to transform our lives and to really be what God has called us to be. I've never been to Mount Rushmore. Anybody here ever been to Mount Rushmore? A couple of you have. That's awesome. I want to go one day. I mean, I think it's kind of a neat place. And I mean, I've seen pictures and seen it on TV like a lot of you have. And, and if that's the only thing I ever get to do, I guess that's okay. But, you know, when they made Mount Rushmore... <laughs> They used some of the hardest tools known to man at that time during its construction. They didn't finish that job with a little manicure set. They refined it with explosives and big hammers and big chisels. And we've got this mentality that, that God, we want you to transform us, but be easy on us. We want you to transform us and make us what you want us to be, but can you be real tender in the process? Now, I'll tell you this. Whatever you face as a believer, as God tries to transform you and mold you and to make you what he would have you to be, you'll never be there alone. And the Bible says he'll never put on you more than you can handle. But understand this, you can handle more than you think because it's not you handling it. It's God handling it through you. And so sometimes as God desires to, to manipulate us and to transform us through the afflictions of our life, Sometimes he gets an old hammer out and an old chisel out. And sometimes life is tough. But all of it is for one reason. To be transformed in such a way so that you and I look more like him. A.W. Tozer said, if God has singled you out to be a special object of his grace, you may expect him to honor you with stricter discipline and greater suffering than less favored ones who are called to endure. I submit to you this morning this last idea. There are a few ways in which you and I can choose to honor God. Choose to trust him. These things happen in the furnace of affliction. An affliction that brings about transformation. 
My last question for you this morning is this. Are you willing to be transformed? Are you willing for God to do whatever it takes in your life for you just to be what He wants you to be? Not any more. Not any less. But just to be what God wants you to be. You know, it's easy to honor God when things are really good. It's easy to honor and trust Him when life is going well. But that's not all of our lives. Matter of fact, that's none of our lives all of the time. But to honor Him during the affliction. To honor Him when it's tough. When we're being overwhelmed. To honor Him will bring about a transformation that will break us Oh, what he wants us to be. That is my prayer for me. God, continue to work in my life. God, continue to transform me. God, help me through the struggles. Help me face it. I know I'm not alone. And I know I'm not alone, not just because I know God's there, but I know you're there. Man, I've got family and friends and loved ones and a church that's there for each other. And there's something special about this church, ladies and gentlemen. I, we're not perfect, but, man, Friendship Baptist Church, we're, we're just that. We're Friendship Baptist Church. And we try our best to love each other. And we try our best to make differences for each other and to be there for each other, to help each other. Again, we're not perfect. None of us are. But we serve a God who is. And so we desire this morning, I pray, to be transformed. To be more like Him. If you're here today and you need that transformation in your life, maybe you need to be transformed into a relationship with Him. Maybe this morning you realize that if you walk out this door today and something happens to you, you've never really given your life to Jesus. You may have joined a church somewhere down the line. I don't care about that. But have you really given your life to Jesus? Is he really on the inside? And I don't care what the outside looks like. The outside doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen. You can be the most beautiful, loving, Christian-looking person on the outside. But if Jesus isn't on the inside, then you're just fooling yourself and a bunch of other people. But you're not fooling him. And so maybe the transformation that needs to happen in your life today is a, a transformation of Christ. Maybe you need to give your life to him today. If that's the case, I, I'll be down here. Not that I have to do anything. I mean, man, come to this altar. Ask Jesus to save you. Now then you need to tell the world about it. But that's all you got to do. You really mean it? You want it? Man, he's ready for you. He's ready to transform you. And then for us believers here today, the transformation that needs to continue to happen in our life. Man, I don't care how long you've been a believer, you're still not where you need to be. I don't care how many times you read the Bible each week. You're still not where you need to be. The transformation process, ladies and gentlemen, is something that continues to happen over and over and over again in our lives. And so don't slow down. Maybe as a Christian, you've kind of been just kind of even keel for a while. Maybe it's time to say, Lord, I, I want to do more. Lord, I have, I have kind of been in the background for years of my life. I, I, believe, I know I'm saved, God, but, but you know what? I've not done anything for you. I've just kind of been here or been nowhere. And so maybe it's time to do something about that. You can call it making a recommitment, and rededication. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But if you need to do it, that's what's important. Do it. Make a commitment to Him to be transformed into what God would have us to be. Let's pray. Father, this morning, 
By your grace and mercy, Father, we have been blessed beyond measure. Father, all the things that you have done for us, all the ways that, Father, you have touched our lives, we, we thank you, Father. And Father, now this time and this invitation, we come together asking and praying for your will to be done. Father, asking and praying that, Father, for any decision that needs to be made, Father, for the altar to be filled, Father, I'm down front. If, a, if decisions need to be made publicly, Father, whatever it is, Father, may you transform us to be more like you. May thy will be done, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Stand with me. Sing with me this morning. Come forward, pray. <clears throat> Whatever God's put on your heart, I invite you to come.